foreigners pulled a record amount of money out of China during the second quarter. And then in July, Chinese banks cut back on lending to the real economy for the first time in 19 years. At the same time, the Chinese central bank is turning to some truly authoritarian tactics to try to get control over an epic bond rally that is really just the other side of foreigners fleeing and banks scaling back. It's almost like the Chinese missed all the negative attention. The U.S. labor market managed to steal away the spotlight of awful for a little while there, so I guess China just wants it back. Over the last few days, it's been one thing after another after another. Like I said in yesterday's video, this thing is globally synchronized and all of it relates to the downside of the supply shock. And it's still a total risk off in Beijing's neighborhood. Even Chinese stocks that had been soaring into recovery into the middle of May, they've now given back almost all of it. Bond yields over there have been crashing to record lows, provoking draconian tactics from the People's Bank of China, trying desperately to put a floor under interest rates. They've gone even so far as to direct banks to back out of bond trades. Foreign direct investment turned into a record decline and only the second time it's fallen at all, and that's in the entire data series history. The credit stats that just came out today were an ugly mess all their own. Even more so when you factor how much authorities have tried to stimulate bank lending. It's almost like the PBOC is taking out its frustration over lack of success on everything about Chinese bondholders who want nothing more than protection against a world that is heading into recession Chinese authorities can't do much or anything about. While everyone was distracted by Japanese stocks being crashed by U.S. unemployment, China continues to sink. And if their markets over there have anything to say about it, well, they're just like the markets over here. So where do we even begin? Well, let's start with foreign direct investment. According to the latest statistics from China's SAFE, or State Administration of Foreign Exchange, foreign direct investment in the second quarter of 2024 was another negative, only the second time in the, in the series history, and this one was even bigger than the third quarter of last year. By the numbers, minus 15 billion in the second quarter, that followed two consecutive quarters of, I guess, foreigners were putting more money back into China. Maybe they were buying into the whole stimulus idea. Who knows what the case may be? But essentially, the second quarter of 2024, they thought, well, we better get out of it. Uh, we better get, we better look for something else. So looking over the last four quarters, including this latest one, You've got two negative quarters, the only two negative quarters in that one year period. And for the entire four quarter period, foreign direct investment was basically unchanged. Just $1 billion on net positive. That, that compares to the four quarters before then of plus $82.5 billion. And what people have been saying as foreign direct investment has fallen off since the middle of 2022, really the first part of 2022, is that China and the rest of the world is just renormalizing. They say this about the U.S. economy as well, that after a period of, of a substantial growth and upside of artificiality and everything else, things are just kind of coming back down to where they were before. But as we've seen over the last year or so, we went way past normalization and into this is something big, something, something very much like a recession and contraction. Foreign businesses in China that were enthusiastic about building out capacity during the supply shock, trying to build their way out of the supply shock, suddenly in 2022, moving forward, they decided, I don't want to build much or anything in China at all. And it makes perfect sense, the timing. In the, in the first or second quarter of 2022, in the second quarter of 2022 in particular, that's when foreign direct investment really began to fall off. And it wasn't the Federal Reserve's rate hikes putting the brakes on the global economy. It was, number one, the global economy starting to fall apart because of this, the oil price shock, and as well as prices that were due from the supply shock itself. But also keep in mind, this was when we had the zero COVID Shanghai lockdowns. That was one of the things that foreigners in particular looked at and said, I think we need to take a second look at what we're doing in China and what the consequences of that will be just in purely financial and economic terms. Forget about the politics. So CNY started to go down at the same time that foreigners began to pull out of the country. And it has not stopped. No matter what the, what the authorities in Beijing have done, FDI continues to get weaker and weaker to the point now that twice over the last year, twice over the last four quarters, foreign direct investment has actually declined. 
And as bad as that is, I mean, that's the outside perspective of China or the outside looking into China. It was even worse from the inside. The credit statistics still continue to astound us because they continue to get worse and worse and worse. Chinese banks want nothing to do with the Chinese economy, even though they have authorities breathing down their necks. They want to stimulate lending so they can stimulate at least some stability in the real economy. But for the first time since, I believe, July of 2005, lending to the real economy, that is loans to either non-financial corporations or households, so we're excluding other financial firms, loans to the real economy actually contracted. First time in 19 years. According to the latest financial statistics report from the, from the uh, People's Bank of China, Yuan denominated loans to the rest of the real economy actually declined by 77 billion yuan or about 10.7 billion in dollar equivalents. And we haven't seen anything like that in a very long time. The reason primarily was household loans fell yet again. Despite all of the stimulus, lower mortgage rates, uh, first time aid to home buyers, all that kind of stuff, first time home buyer aid, household loans in the month of July were down by 220 billion yuan. And then loans extended to non-financial corporations, those were up barely, just plus 150 billion, which was one of the lowest totals for corporate, corporate lending and corporate borrowing in the series as well. So there's no lending to the real economy. There's just a little bit of lending to other financial firms and not much else. So the total aggregate stock of RMB loans in China declined yet again. The growth rate declined yet again to 8.7%, which is another record low. Though I will point out that the PBOC did um, revise last month's total. They had initially shown a decline, a, a deceleration in the growth rate down to 8.3%, which is a pretty sharp de deceleration in the just in the month of June. They've since revised that to 8.8%. So this 8.7% for July is another new record low, which is not as shocking and, and really visceral as the, as the last month's number had been. Either way, lending in China continues to fall off and fall off where it really needs to be going in the opposite direction to the real economy. We saw that in the total social financing statistics as well. Aggregate financing to the real, real economy came in at 770 billion, which was obviously a lot less than last month. June is a big month for credit in China, although June 2024 was not a big month for credit in China. But July is sort of a, a seasonal low point for loans and, and bond financing and everything else. But even so, aggregate financing to the real economy was relatively weak at 770 billion yuan. That was better than last year, but that was because of government uh, programs and government fundraising. In terms, again, just RMB loans in the month of July, according to total social financing, new RMB loans flows just 260 billion yuan. That managed, that was even less than July of 2023, which was 346 billion. So banks are not extending loans. They're not extending credit. They're not doing anything authorities would like them to do, which is to do something positive in order to stabilize China's economy and to give it a chance to maybe then start to recover. But banks are becoming even more risk averse. Households don't want to borrow. They want nothing to do with the property sector. And as long as the situation continues like this, China is stuck. They're going to get stuck because the global economy is heading toward recession as well. So there's external drag on top of this internal situation. And the key to it, and authorities know this, would be the banking system. But the banking system is retreating just not quite as quickly as foreigners are. At least the foreigners have the option of getting out of China where the banks are kind of stuck where they are. All they can do is pull back on their balance sheets and hope everything kind of gets better at some point. But as we know only too well over here, hope is not a strategy. It's a Federal Reserve or Central Bank tactic, but it's not an actual real strategy. So of course, demand for safety and liquidity in China is through the roof. It makes perfect sense. Not only do you have lower growth and inflation expectations, you also have rising fear, at least uncertainty, which is driving many, many investors in China into government bonds. There is an epic bond rally in the, in the Chinese system and Chinese authorities are doing everything they can to disrupt it. Because think about it, they're trying to sell this narrative of stabilization, of positivity, of effective policies and everything else. 
You can't have that with safety and liquidity being prime in prime demand and lower growth and inflation expectations priced so visibly that everybody knows what the, what the score really is over there. So the PBOC has been trying various tactics to try to interrupt this bond rally, including last month's big idea was to amass a whole bunch, bunch of uh, hundreds of billions of yuan worth of government bonds that the, the, uh, the PBOC could borrow in order to then short sell them into the marketplace. Yeah, because that was a great idea. Let's, let's short sell a couple hundred billion in bonds into an epic bond rally. So of course the Chinese, Chinese haven't actually done any selling because it's all really about talk. It's all, they're just like Western central banks. They really, it's all about threatening. It's all about posturing. So they haven't sold anything. And of course the bond rally has kept on going. So that has left the authorities over in China to attempt some macro prudential tactics, which are becoming really extreme in their own right. From just a couple days ago, Bloomberg reported in a highly unusual move on Friday, that's this last Friday, Regulators told rural banks in China's Jingxi province not to settle recent purchases of government bonds in order to effectively renege on their market obligations. It was the latest in a string of interventions designed to cool a market rally that sent yields to record lows and stoked official concerns that banks have become too exposed to interest rate risk. And that's how they're selling this. They're saying that they don't want any banks in China to become Silicon Valley Bank or First Republic. We don't want this bond bubble to burst and therefore create a wave of bank failure. So that's what they're saying. This is, this is nothing more than trying to get control over a bond bubble. When in reality, it's just like what I just said, which is that China and its authorities are trying to sell a recovery that the marketplace is actively and heavily betting against. They want to they want to disrail the or de, they want to derail the bond rally because it shows how ineffective their policies are and it, furthermore it depresses sentiment mood activity and everything else it's counterproductive to the goals that the PBOC and the Chinese government have set out and that's not all this is just the beginning there's been a flurry of activity from the PBOC to do something about this bond rally here's another one from Bloomberg this one from just yesterday at least four Chinese brokerages have started fresh measures to cut back trading of domestic government bonds beginning last week, people familiar with the matter said. The brokers reduced the trading of sovereign debt with one of them even suspending transactions in some maturities, the people said, requesting not to be named because these are this is China and Xi Jinping doesn't take kindly to all this. Well, most of the firms called it a voluntary move. We all know it's not voluntary. One person said the change came following guidance, quote unquote guidance from authority. Yeah, Xi Jinping gives you guidance. That's not a, that's not guidance. It's actually a, uh, it's, it's an order, a command to do what it, what, whatever it is they want you to do. So this voluntary suspension of trading in certain parts of the government bond market, it's a transparent attempt to narrow the ways in which very desperate bondholders in China or prospective bondholders can get their hands on these government bonds. And really it's a show of force trying to say that we control things here. And if you don't like it, we'll do things that are really authoritarian and draconian to enforce what it is we want the market to do. It's, it's the opposite of exactly the message that they're trying to send. They want to send a message of hope and recovery when they're in, instead sending a message of increasingly dour outlooks that are that are being dealt with in very heavy-handed fashion. This is not going to help them in the long run. And that's not all. Because Bloomberg also reported a couple days back further, financial regulators this week told state-run banks to log the details of the counterparties that purchase long-dated government bonds on a daily basis, said people familiar with the matter, requesting not to be named, lest Xi Jinping find out. It's the first time such a request has been made to the lenders involved, at least the people said. So now they're cataloging and taking down names to know who to track down and say, Master Xi is not happy with you. Don't ever do that again. So they tried to cajole the market through this program to short sell into the marketplace, to use market techniques in order to, to stop the bond rally. And that, of course, didn't work. So now they're telling brokers and banks to redig on trades. You bought bonds. You better give those back. We'll see how that works. And then if that, I mean, now they're taking the names of people who are buying bonds. They're narrowing the amount of bonds that are offered through brokerage firms 
They're really stepping things up because the bond rally in China has gotten to be absolutely huge. As of August 4th, the 10-year 10 10-year 10 government bond yield got down to just a little bit less than 2.10%. And it had been 2.22% on G uh, July 24th. So right around the time that swap spreads in the in US dollar terms were starting to get really negative anticipating what was about to happen, you had a really big rally get to its low point in Chinese government bonds. But since around August 8th, when all of this stuff started to show up on the PBOC, from the PBOC on the marketplace radar, yields have backed up, but only a little bit. As of this morning, before I started recording, maybe a backup of around nine to 10 basis points. And that's with everything that the government has thrown into it. China's two year, that one got down to around 151, 152 on, again on July 25th. And it was hanging around that level until August 6th when the world started to turn the other way and we started to get to more from China's central bank. Since then, it's only backed up about seven, eight basis points in yield too. So the bond rally has taken a pause here while it reassesses how, how significant these heavy-handed and authoritarian tactics might be. But it doesn't seem to be going, it doesn't seem to be going anywhere because China's economy, its financial system, everything is still the same. Even as I mentioned in the introduction, China's stock market. Shanghai SSE, which had been soaring from the lows back in January through February, March, April, and into May when the Chinese authorities announced their historic property sector rescue, which was a complete and utter dud. Ever since that announcement, Chinese stocks have been joining the bond market rally and betting against Beijing. Copper to gold being one of the lowest levels really in the last 35 years in China. Everything about China is consistent with that. You look at where copper to gold is and you say, how can that be the same as, how can it be the same low level as 2020 or December 2008 or for China 2016? And the, everything that we just talked about here in this video is a perfect example. And then you pile on top of that, Europe can't get out of a recession and the U.S. looks like it's going all the way into one here. You've got a globally synchronized mess. So of course, copper to gold is at a relatively low level, an exceptionally low level. Of course, U.S. dollar swap spreads are exceptionally negative levels. Of course, interest rates in China, as well as outside China, are at exceptionally low levels, low growth and inflation expectations, high degree of demand for safety and liquidity. So where do we even begin with wrapping this up? So foreign direct investment, that of course was a record negative in the second quarter because it makes perfect sense. Foreigners, maybe they thought China was gonna turn things around late last year in the first part of this year, but then they said, okay, this isn't happening. Foreign direct investment turns negative in the second quarter. That makes perfect sense. Chinese banks who are supposed to be stimulating the economy, who, have been, who are supposed to have been stimulated, instead they're cutting back too. So you got foreigners saying, we don't have nothing to do with China. You got Chinese banks saying, we don't have nothing to do with China either. Cutting back loans to the real economy for the first time in 19 years. Given all of that and a whole lot more, especially the macroeconomic data, what it looks like in the real economy already, of course, there is an epic bond rally in China. And of course, Chinese authorities are going to say they're worried about a bond bubble when they're really worried about is controlling a narrative. Well, the narrative isn't flying in China and everything backs up the bond market. Everything that we talked about here with regard to China follows the macroeconomic statistics that were released the last month showing the macroeconomy is just like everything we just talked about. That's the video I've got linked below. As always, thank you very much for joining me. Huge thank you, Eurodollar University members and subscribers. And until next time, take care.